So uh, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Kathleen Shearer. I'm the executive director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And um, I'm delighted to be here today. And I also um, like to introduce you to my two colleagues, Ilkay Holt, who is helping to manage and organize the webinar for us, and Paul Walk, who is um, a member of the Next Generation Repositories Working Group, who provided important input into our response to Plan S. So I thought I'd briefly take you through um, our reaction and our response and, and, um, and then probably try to save most of the time for comments or questions from the people who are participating. Okay, so, um, so very briefly, I just have to get some of these things out of the out of my screen. So very briefly, I'm sure most of you have heard about Plan S and they, um, I think it was in November they published, or earlier than November, September, they published a set of principles. And really the intent of Plan S is to, um, to move forward open access and progress um, the adoption of open access um, because they feel the funders that are involved in Plan S are feeling that uh, things are moving too slowly. So um, I think it was in September they published 10 principles and then more recently in December they came out with um, the implementation guide guidance. And the implementation guidance really um, uh, includes, uh, it has three kind of options or three and three and a half options. One is to publish in an open access journal or an open access platform that provides immediate open access. The second is to deposit, uh, to publish in a subscription journal and deposit immediately into an open access repository that makes that um, article openly available. And the third is to publish in a, um, I guess, a hybrid journal. And uh, you're only allowed really to publish in the hybrid journal if that journal or the publisher has um, indicated that it will be transforming into a fully open access venue uh, soon. Okay, so I think um, from the core perspective, we, we really wanted to just focus on replying to the implementation guidance related to repositories. But uh, in general, our, 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 our broad reactions to Plan S are that we, we are very supportive of the goals of Plan S and we feel Plan S is a, a good step towards progressing open access and we completely agree in, in the goal of immediate and full open access to, to published articles. Um, we're also very pleased that in the implementation guidance that they've included repositories as one of the mechanisms or routes for pro promoting, uh, for providing open access. And um, uh, for those of you that have been following the work around next generation repositories, we see them as important mechanisms for moving away from commercial control of, of um, publishing and promoting in, uh, innovation in, in scholarly publishing in general. And then our third reaction really is that we want to make sure that um, the requirements um, in Plan S regarding repositories are feasible and that repositories can implement the, the requirements. And they also are um, in step in terms of how we see the future of repositories going. So we think that the functionality that they require should be the functionality that we, we also agree with in terms of where we see repositories going. And again, this is based on um, a year and a half or two years of, of work with that, our expert group around um, next generation repositories. So um, very briefly, the, this is the guidance um, that was provided related to compliance for repositories with Plan S. And um, you'll see here there's about seven requirements. Uh, one is automated manuscript ingest. The second is full text stored in XML in JATS standard or equivalent. The third is quality assured metadata. The fourth is an open API to allow others to access content. Uh, 
um, a Q&A, which is quality assurance process to integrate full text with core abstracting and indexing services, um, continuous availability, and um, ha having a help desk. And so I'm just going to take you through what our um, response was, our initial response to these specific requirements. And um, I'd just like to preface this by saying that we published something, many of you have probably seen our response, but I think we are going to revise that a little bit based on some feedback we've been getting from the community. And so we will be submitting um, a second iteration of our response directly to the, um, directly to the authors of, of Plan S. So um, our initial response is that we, we completely agree with the requirement about quality assured metadata and standard interoperable format, and it's something that CORE has been promoting. Um, and also the um, continuous availability of content, something that most of our repositories are keen to support. Um, in terms of uh, uh, some of the requirements we thought should be um, not required, but but they could recommend. So in a way, um, we were concerned about uh, how onerous some of these um, requirements were. Uh, and so we thought some of these things could be recommended rather than required. Um, the first one is the open API, which would allow others to um, to interact or gain access to the resources, and we would recommend that uh, the Open API is resource sync, something that came out of our next generation repositories. And the second is the automated manuscript ingest facility. Again, we think this is a nice, this would be a nice functionality, but we're concerned about the ability of repositories to be able to implement it. And then finally, we, we kind of disagreed with um, three of the other requirements. One was the help desk. This is like quite a, an onerous requirement. We don't think every repository should need to have a help desk, um, but rather a contact number or some way of contacting the services is sufficient. Um, the second is um, integrating full text uh, with core abstract and indexing services. Um, because we certainly couldn't require these indexing services to, to index repositories. They don't do it now. And um, we, there's no real mechanism to force them to, to do that. Um, in addition, because we're collecting article, the manuscripts, the um, author accepted manuscript, the full text final publication is usually abstract and indexed, not the, the author's manuscript. And then the third thing that we disagreed with was the full text stored in, in XML and JAT standard. And this, this we just thought was too onerous. And also there are other methods for facilitating um, text and data mining, um, which really involve um, batch extracting of content from repositories and aggregating it, which is, I think, the way that um, uh, several text and data mining services already work with repositories like um, CORE, C-O-R-E, or, or OpenAir. Um, and so with that, I would like to invite, first of all, Paul to add any um, of his additional comments or um, maybe further, description, further explanation of our technical responses, and then I'd like to open it up to you, the participants, to share your comments and thoughts and questions that you have. So, um, Paul, can I turn it over to you? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I think I, there was only one thing I really wanted to add, which was the, the last point that you were making about the, um, we consider this requirement that repositories store full text in XML formats to be, um, First of all, uh, uh, quite a high barrier for repositories to implement, um, certainly in any kind of um, short term. But also, some a slightly old-fashioned way of looking at um, how resources are made available in a, a resource-oriented uh, network like the web. Um, we're really interested in the in, in the core next generation working group um, work in the idea of. Um, repositories being part of a distributed network of services and infrastructure 
Um, and as Kathleen alluded to, there are already um, very well established and good services which um, harvest content and then transform into those um, formats to enable text mining quite successfully. So I think we would rather see the emphasis being on repositories making their content easily discovered, um, easily um, accessed and retrieved and, and harvested and aggregated and so on. So the repositories can be the resource providers in those kinds of um, networks of services. Um, and in that sort of architecture and that sort of world, it's not necessary for the repositories themselves to um, directly support each and every one of these services. They just need to make their resources available in a proper, open, um, licensed way. That's really the only comment I wanted to add. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, so I open it up uh, for questions. Either you can um, raise your hand and, and Ilkai will turn the mic on so you can just um, speak into the mic with your question or you're also welcome to put your question into the, the chat. Um, and while we're waiting, uh, there's already a question from Peter Murray Rust about um, TDM, and maybe Paul, you are better placed to answer this than I am. He asks, what formats will you require? Um, PDF is not acceptable for TDM. No, TDM, uh, PDF is, is no use for um, doing text and data mining directly. Um, but really, I think that the step that we, we want to encourage is that repositories make um, the resources that they have available for other services to um, get direct and machine-oriented access to those resources so that they can then prepare them for text data mining um, and this is this is already happening with some of the larger aggregation services um, in an ideal world we wouldn't be collecting large um, amounts of, of PDFs but but that is the reality at the moment um, there are mechanisms for transforming PDFs into something more usable um, I think in our view of this rather than trying to solve that at um, the level of each repository we we're happy that that can be solved at a uh, at the level of the the service which wants to provide um resources that are, are more suitable for text mining and indeed do some of the text mining um and to facilitate that what we need to do is make repositories um operate in a way which makes it much easier for those aggregations to um to get access to those resources, to discover them and, and retrieve them. Um, and that's been really at the heart of the Next Generation Repositories Working Group, or certainly one of the main um, sort of planks of that work has been around that um, um, machine-oriented discovery, navigation and retrieval of, of resources. Okay, I'll just, um, uh, there's been a response here from Peter, so I'll just read it out and then I'll move on to the next question. Um, I don't want repos to get the idea that PDF is acceptable. HTML, LaTeX, and even Word are hugely better. The point is that Plan S is requiring full text. It should be semantically parsable. Do you want to respond, Paul, or, or would you like me to move on to the next um. Well, I, I think I agree with Peter. Um, I think that the comment we were making was about the requirement for um, repositories capturing um, or, or making available fully marked up XML um, full text. Um, we could actually have a separate discussion about um, gradually moving repositories into a, a mode where they're capturing um, more reusable and accessible formats than PDF. Um, but I think that's a slightly separate issue to the response to the Plan S um, requirement, which was very specifically about uh, JATs and XML. Okay, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, all right, let's move on. There are no hands up. I'm just going to re continue reading from the chat then. Um, Serge Bowen from France says, a group here in France has identified an issue 
uh, that of CC BY licenses, which may cause useless op opposition. Some want ND for integrity, other NC for various reasons. Um, what about position from uh, core about that? Um, so we did talk about that um, at the core executive board, but uh, we don't have a consensus on the executive board. Um, and I think it's basically related to region, different regional approaches to, to CC BY, um, and um, some support CC BY non-commercial and, and some don't. So uh, we will not be coming out with a, a, a core position on that just because there's not a consensus at the level of our executive board. Um, but I, I, I recognize that um, it could be something that uh, even because we have, um, can't get a consensus at our uh, eight member executive board, I recognize that it could be an issue with others as well. Um, so Lise has a comment here. John, what's the plan for a hypothesized version you posted above? Submitting, okay, so this is um, a version with, that's been annotated um, that was shared by John Tennant above. Submitting it is as is as a submission. So maybe John, you can just respond in the, in the text to that. And I'll move on to Vanessa's comment. Uh, Vanessa Proudman, as far as I know, the Plan S group are concerned about the PDF as bring the standard and that we aren't moving away from that. Um, okay, thank you, Vanessa. We'll keep that in mind. And Peter says, also note that many researchers require 50,000 articles for system systematic reviews. Uh, here's another question. Gareth O'Neill, linked to the licensing question, to what extent does ND license on full limit, full text limit TDM, where derivatives need to be made? Um, Paul, do you have an answer to that? Um, well, no, this is a very much an open question that's been argued about all over the place. Yeah. Um, I think that there clearly are some issues there. Um, I noted also that um, the Plan S requirement was for um, Creative Commons version 4 licenses specifically, which just as a, a minor detail seems to me a little um, unnecessary where there are perfectly good um, examples of people having used earlier versions of Creative Commons licenses um, already in, in repositories and other systems, but I guess they just went with the, uh, you know, the latest version. Okay, um, moving to the next uh, question. What do you think are the implications of Plan S for OA repositories in Global South? Um, well, I, I think the concern uh, from my colleagues in the Global South, and we have um, Bianca Amaro on our executive board, and I, I communicate regularly with um, La Referencia, which is um, a, a network of nine countries in the um, South America and, and Central America, um, is, is more around, um, initially they were concerned that repositories would not be part of the requirements for Plan S. So um, uh, they really very strongly believe that repositories are an important route for supporting open access because they don't, they don't have the ability to pay article processing charges. So repositories are very important for them. Um, and they recognize that anything that's adopted, widely adopted in Europe, North America, and, and China, for example, will probably move the whole world in, in that direction. So initially, I think they were quite concerned that repositories were going to be a, um, a formal accepted mechanism for um, uh, adhering to Plan S, which they are. Um, and then I think the second issue is really around being able to ad um, adhere to technical requirements. So a lot of the repositories in South America are using old, older versions of software already. 
So um, it would be very, very difficult for them to, um, you know, uh, many, many of the organizations in, in Latin America, the universities, to be able to um, upgrade their software to adhere to these technical recommendations. I mean, we, we know in, in um, the global north that it will be hard. So the implications of that are that if, if those universities um, can't adhere to the requirements, then um, this will become something that's, that only can be done through large, well-resourced repositories or by um, having a license with a commercial company that, that does it for you. So they would really like to keep um, their infrastructure local in Latin America, and they, they definitely um, prefer to use non-commercial solutions. So those are the kind of discussions I've, I've heard from the Latin American community. And uh, I think there are probably some people here uh, on our call from Latin America, and I welcome them to um, provide their input as well. Okay, um, John, has uh, Tenant has replied to Lee, so I'll let you folks read his reply. Serge Bowen says, um, what about relaxing CC by as an objective uh, while accepting non-commercial or ND or both? Um, again, I mean, I can bring these kind of comments back to my executive board, but I'm not sure that we will um, be able to get consensus. Okay, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to scroll down to another question. So Gareth says, to what extent should repositories be responsible for making the full text of an author's accepted manuscript or version of record machine readable? Um, well, Paul, do you want to say something? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and I think this is a question where the answer that I, I feel I must give is the pragmatic answer rather than the, the answer I would necessarily like to give. Um, I think it is a shame and it is a, a real limitation in our otherwise, you know, interesting and, and potentially very powerful distributed network of repositories that many of the resources that are held in those repositories are not machine readable. Um, that is to say they're papers in PDF format. Um, but the pragmatic answer is that the, there's an even more basic problem we need to solve first, which is that uh, many of those resources are not actually even machine accessible in any kind of reliable way. Um, and so the focus in the work that CORE has been doing in the last, uh, as in this CORE, Coalition, Confederation of Open Access Repositories, has been doing in the last year or so, has been to really focus on the problem of um, helping repositories to um, adopt technologies and approaches which allow those resources to be reliably discoverable by um, machine processes, by, by software, um, as well as by by people um, and we really need to get that solved first um, before um, the issue of those resources be being machine readable is even relevant um, and in the meantime as I say there are services which are harvesting and aggregating uh, those resources um, and indexing them and so on in a way which makes them more useful uh, for machine processes such as uh, text and data mining. Um, the point that Peter made earlier on in the thread about researchers needing a, you know, a critical mass of, of, um, of resources before they can do any kind of meaningful uh, mining is, is a, a good point. And again, the um, approach of harvesting and aggregating these resources in larger numbers um, certainly helps um, to, to provide those kinds of large-scale uh, corpora of, of, of resources which individual repositories might struggle to, to provide. So I think the answer to Gareth's question is ideally we would certainly want repositories, uh, all of the resources in repositories to be usable in the, you know, the growing number of um, possible um, software processes which researchers and other people want to bring to bear on these resources 
but our focus at the moment is on um, making those resources at least uh, reliably discoverable and and retrievable by by software processes yeah and and again I, I'd like to reiterate like I think a lot of our feedback is really around looking at the ability of repositories to respond to some of these requirements and the costs and resources required and if ultimately plan s has requirements that are so onerous that most repositories can't adopt them we will just be moving in the same direction as we did with with commercial publishing and that is only large well-resourced repositories or commercial entities will be able to adhere to plan s and become legitimate venues so we really want to support this community distributed community um, network that we already have we want to strengthen it and we want to make sure it's part of any formal um, uh, requirements around um, disseminating and providing access to content okay so um, Jessica says are there aspects regarding methodologies for measuring usage across repositories and repository platforms that might be relevant to comment upon uh, standardization of usage metrics for example something that interesting uh, per se for researchers so um, there's been a reply already to Jessica and I think from the core perspective we are promoting um, as a long-term longer-term vision that we have common usage statistics across repositories so we're trying to work on that um, at the level of different regions first um, and I know open air is working on that in Europe and we're trying to align what's happening in Latin America with Europe and um, hopefully that will spread um, across the world eventually so that we all do uh, measure the way usage um, the way we, um, uh, users use repository content in the same way okay not seeing any new comments uh, here we go from and of course there's iris uk already that is also um, very far ahead in terms of doing this in in the uk and now working with us us australia and new zealand um, vanessa says agreed kathleen but what um, do we ideally want for the future do plan aspects respond positively or negatively to that on the machine readability front if we need projects and more resources to implement then let's tell them yeah I, I think Vanessa that's a good point um, we're kind of trying to get a balance in terms of of not having you know a 50 page response to plan s but I think it's a good point if we could identify specific areas where we think are important for the adoption of, of uh, requirements and and the need for resources again like the I think we probably don't believe that XML for all repositories is the right way to go, but rather um, access to content and maybe moving away from the PDF. But again, we also have to look at the practicality of that to, uh, to be able to support that um, uh, by 2020, which is only a year away from now. Paul, do you have anything else you want to add to, to Vanessa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that covers it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Jessica Lindholm. Um, the timeline seems hard for many researchers to accept, perhaps correctly. Does CORE agree on the short timeline? Are there aspects that we should consider as problematic, even though we as open access advocates generally applaud it? Um, I, I think CORE's perspective is that the timeline is okay um, and we uh, there has to be a timeline because again I think the, the purpose of Plan S or where Plan S came from was from a, a place of frustration that things were moving too slowly so um, I think we agree with the, the timeline but again looking uh, pragmatically at the um, technical requirements especially in terms of repositories 
I think as open access advocates, we should generally applaud um, finance. I, I think that the, the timeline is slightly misleading as well in the sense that um, the way it's phrased is that the, these requirements would start to be included in um, uh, in grants um, from 2020, oh, sorry, in calls from 2020. So one would assume that um, implementation of the actual implementation of these guidelines themselves would not um, necessarily follow until some time after that. It's, I think it's been quite carefully phrased, actually, to be to have a quite a lot of uh, flexibility after 2020. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I wasn't quite sure about that actually myself. I, 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 I but I'd have to go back and, and look at that. Um, so uh, Vanessa Proudman asks, is CORE happy um, with the uh, repositories being recommended, uh, with Plan S recommending deposit and repositories rather than requiring it? Is this a missed opportunity? <laughs> um, uh, I think Paul and I, and Ilkay and I were just discussing this before the the webinar and it is I think a missed opportunity uh, it would be great if plan s required all content to be all articles to be deposited into repositories um, but I I think that that's um, not going to happen even if we made a recommendation towards that as a even if a number of us made recommendations towards that so I think we've kind of fallen on the the side of pragmatism and um, hoping that if we don't ask too much, the things that we do ask for will be adopted and implemented in their next version of the, the final guidance. Okay. So I see a hand up. Luke Drury. Would you like to say something? You have a question or comment? Uh, yes, hi. Um, I should introduce myself. I was the lead author on the Alia response to Plan S, which you may have seen. Um, basically, I think we have very similar views to the views you've been expressing in core. It seems to me that the key issue actually is the interaction between the publishing system and the research evaluation system. And certainly it's clear that a lot of the initial opposition to Plan S has come from particularly early stage career researchers who worry that if they can't show letters to nature or PRL papers that they will be discriminated against. So I was interested whether you've actually thought about how deposition in repositories as against the more traditional publishing route interacts with research evaluation and whether we can do something to raise the status of preprint deposition in repositories and thereby address this issue. So uh, I hope that's clear enough. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, we have thought a lot about that. And I think we see we, our, our vision, you know, as kind of outlined in next generation repositories is that that we kind of decouple publishing, you know, uh, one innovation that could happen in the ideal world is that publishing and preservation, um, management and access of content are decoupled, uh, peer review, I should say. So, um, so I think what, what we would like to see in the future is moving from repositories collecting post prints of published articles to repositories collecting preprints and then having the peer review um, built on top, which would mean they essentially, the content in, in repositories would have the same status as journals. Um, the, the challenge around that really is how do you get there from where we are now? And how do we, um, how do we create an environment where the content in repositories is, is trusted by 
uh, the broader community around um, re uh, peer review, um, domain communities, and research administrators, and so on. So I think we're, we're doing a lot of thinking about what, what is the path to get to where we would like to be, but um, the road isn't necessarily that clear right now. I, I hope that answers your question. Do you have a, a, any thoughts? No, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's exactly it. I mean, overlay journals are one possibility, which I find very interesting, uh, but we have to gain acceptance and I, I do think we need to discover some new and better form of peer review, which can be implemented using online resources. Uh, and in many ways, that's the key, but it's one thing to identify the problem. It's another to find the solution. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I, and I think we're trying to work with some, you know, we've already been involved in a project with um, Timothy Gowers to build an overlay journal on top of Archive. Mm. So we're trying to learn some things about that, but it really means uh, very um, being able to, uh, shall we say, promote this idea with re the research community and getting some researchers who are well established to help uh, try some pilot projects to start doing these kind of things. And, you know, that's also not easy because researchers are busy with their own research. And there are disincentives because obviously mm -hmm. you, you are stuck within the current system and mm -hmm. you need a lot of courage to risk jumping to a new system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just out of interest, I mean, it seems odd to me that the archive, which I use and the professional astrophysicists, so I've been using it for oh, 15 years or so, uh, seem, I mean, the Plan S, reading it, you'd think they'd never heard of the archive. I mean, the, the emphasis on XML instead of LaTeX, it's very strange. Um, I have no idea where that came from. Do you have any ideas? Uh, my feeling, uh, but this is just based on a feeling I have um, with no real evidence, is that they looked at the, at the, pub, the functionality of PubMed Central. Uh -huh. Yes. And they base the requirements on the functionality of PubMed Central. And so, and because archive is a preprint archive rather than collecting peer reviewed published articles, it has kind of been sidelined. Um, there's only a small comment about uh, depositing in preprint archives um, yeah. is not a, a formal way of adhering to Plan S. Yeah, I, I think there are clues all the way through this that this had very much a post-print um, sort of view of repositories. Um, for instance, the strange requirement that repositories um, must be able to accept automated ingests, which I'm not even quite sure what that means, but it supposes that repositories are at the end of some publishing um, chain. Um, you know, a, a really interesting thought experiment uh, that I would love to see discussed would be what, what would happen if we, if Plan S, for, instead of that, insisted that um, preprints were deposited in repositories and then publisher systems were required to um, accept those um, accepted manuscripts from, uh, well, sorry, the preprints from um, repository systems as, as the, the form of getting the uh, the manuscript into the um, publisher's sort of peer review system and so on. Um, and that would be quite an interesting uh, <laughs> thought because it would solve at a stroke the uh, two problems. One, one having a an open access version available uh, in a timely fashion and, and two, um, the problem that all of our repository managers have with collecting um, manuscripts and and adequate metadata it would just become uh, the normal process but you know as we said earlier we we have to um, view this pragmatically especially with this 2020 timeline um, and, and take what steps we can okay we have thanks thanks Paul and thanks Luke um, we have another comment from Paula in uh, from uh, Fio Cruz in Brazil uh, she says, I'm sorry if this question has already been commented on. Um, 
In my point of view, Plan S can be a great opportunity to strengthen the strategy of uh, repositories, like as an option for publication and open access. How do you evaluate the impact of Plan S to repositories? Um, thanks, Paula. Um, I, I'm not as optimistic as you are about how much Plan S will strengthen the role of repositories. I'm very, very glad to see that they, they were included as a, a mechanism for providing open access, which seemed maybe um, questionable or we weren't sure whether they were going to be in the, the, um, when the, the principles were published. Um, but I think, again, they, in the opinion of the authors of Plan S and the, um, the signatories, repositories are probably the, the, the least favored option. So, um, uh, so again, I'm not as optimistic as you are, yet I think we, can, we should do as much as we can with the fact that they were included in, in the Plan S requirements. Okay, so there's some other discussion here. Um, a comment that, that maybe Archive would like to move to XML from LaTeX. Let's see if there are any other questions. Did Coalition S consult with CORE at any point? Um, no, we were not consulted about, um, uh, about Plan S at all. We did provide an, an, some initial input to the, to the principles when they were published and you know we got a nice message back saying thank you very much for your input. But no, uh, we weren't consulted and um, I think it was a missed opportunity for, for them um, because we could have pointed, I think, been very helpful in terms of defining the right kind of requirements for repositories. Um, okay. Does anyone have their hand up? No? Um, there's a comment back to Paul. I've talked to several of Plan S group on these hard requirements. They really want to hear back from us with our suggestions. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Good news. Um, one of the things that um, CORE is hoping is that we when we provide our submissions and a number of organizations probably have comments about the requirements for repositories that we, we kind of align our comments because I think if we, we all submit similar comments, not that everybody's gonna have exactly the same comments, but if we have a number of, um, uh, we have some feedback that we can all align around, I think it's more likely to be implemented in the final version of Plan S requirements. So I know that um, Spark Europe is also, and, and Lieber are also preparing responses. And I've already spoken to, to both Vanessa and, and the, the folks at Lieber. Are there any other comments or thoughts? Is there anything um, that you feel CORE should be doing other than providing a, a response? Okay, here's another comment from Peter or questions. Is there any estimate um, in terms of what portion of the repositories would be compliant with all current requirements of Plan S right now? Oh, I can answer that. One. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, well, basically none. Uh, <laughs> um, well, maybe PubMed Central. Yeah, that's right. A couple of um, centrally hosted and centrally managed repositories um, might well comply um, PubMed Central and 
I, I guess there's possibly one or two others, but um, the the great distributed network of um, institutional and smaller subject repositories would almost certainly not comply with uh, Plan S right now. Yeah, and I mean, um, I think it would be very difficult for them to comply. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And that's, that's really the feedback we need to give um, yep. the, the authors. Uh, so Serge says, maybe CORE's member could try to talk with their local member of Coalition S, if they have one. Well, that's a good idea. So um, uh, I, that's an excellent idea, Serge. I'll see if I can try to mobilize that. I know already the Germans. Some of our German colleagues have spoken to the, to the German funders, but um, perhaps we could look at doing something more targeted related to that. Um, Jay Ripp says, Coalition S seems to envision a brave new world where no current players are valued simply for the purity of their motives. And they seem to envision an ecosystem that doesn't exist at all right now. Even if, uh, even if meant the end of the world of the robust distributed network of repositories, if Plan S achieves its goal, would this be a good thing? Well, I think it would be a dangerous thing because um, one of the things which is most valuable about the uh, robust distributed network of repositories is the distribution of control of those resources. Um, this is a, a good inoculation against uh, monopolistic control of those resources. Um, and if we, if we lose that robust distributed network of repositories, then I can only assume that it would be replaced with um, a much smaller set of um, players controlling those resources, which would be a shame and probably would um, weaken our chance of achieving true open access on a large scale. Yeah, I, I think I'm in agreement with, with Paul on that, that um, we really need to push for the distributed approach, which means that smaller players um, can participate in the system. And that's, that's not just for small institutions. It's also, if you think about um, the world, uh, you know, in a, in a global sense, there are always going to be countries um, that have less resources than others. So it's very important that they also are able to, to play in, and participate in the system. Um, so Serge says they've been in touch with the French funders, which is great. Um, Vanessa has a question for Paul. Several at Plan S are aware that they know that repositories don't comply yet and want them strengthened if they are to be used as serious partners. Um, well, I'll, I'll reply to this, and I guess Paul may ha also have something to say. I mean, I think there's some work to be done around promoting our vision, our distributed vision of repositories and why that's important with the, the people behind Plan S. So it's, um, yes, we wanna strengthen repositories, but um, we wanna strengthen them to have the functionality that we've spent two years thinking about. And we also want um, that, we want to have a feasible implementation timeline to, to have those functionalities adopted. Paul, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, as we've already um, suggested, I think that repositories have not been fully factored into the Plan S view, that they are sort of dealt with somewhat tangentially. Um, and I, I think if we can persuade Plan S to um, consider repositories in a slightly different way, in a slightly more central way, then um, then the requirements will, will change naturally because repositories will be playing a slightly different role in, in that, that worldview. So I think 
somehow we need to have a some feedback to plan s which actually slightly challenges the um the role that they have given to repositories thanks paul and i think that's related to what allison says in the next comment um, this is an ill-formed thought but it seems that plan s wants to change traditional publishing but continues to assume that traditional publishing is sta is the standard Course response does need to acknowledge the challenges that Plan S poses to repositories work, but needs to do so from a perspective that repositories represent a real alternative to traditional publishing that represent a genuine advance on the goals of OA. And I so, think that's what Paul was just saying. And I, I, I think uh, I think Alison has just said what I was trying to say, but yeah. much better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So and th thank you very much for that. And I think that's something we will consider in the next iteration of our response to be more clear um, around um, how we see repositories as being innovative mechanisms for, for strengthening and um, in, in increasing OA, open access. And um, so I, I agree with you, Alison. And again, like it's challenging to get that message out to to the funders we've been working on it but i i, I don't think it's we've been very successful in terms of um, promoting our vision our kind of distributed repository based vision as as widely as as we would like to um, luke has put in a, a link to the his response the alia response um, gareth asks how could repositories concretely be supported by the funders and others to meet some of the requirements of plan s well i suppose um one, uh, we could always use funding towards the development of some of the functionalities um but uh perhaps a stronger statement around the role of repositories would be helpful um, as well. Paul? Oh, sorry, I was typing a reply to Peter and uh, I didn't hear that bit, sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm just responding to how could repositories concretely be supported by funders and others to meet the requirements of Plan S. And I was saying that, you know, of course, there could be resources to develop some of the functionalities in the software platforms that we use, but also maybe a stronger statement by the funders around the importance of the role of repositories. Do you have anything to add? Yes, I think um, I think I think there needs to be a, at least once there needs to be a, a conversation with the authors of Plan S about the possibility that the goals of Plan S could be achieved in a somewhat different way by putting repositories at the very heart of what they're trying to do. Um, and if, if they were persuaded, then um, they could support repositories by actually making um, the requirements which are in Plan S generally um, more focused on repositories, but in a way which is not um, trying to force repositories into a passive role of accepting um, things from the um, current publication pipeline, but um, actually putting repositories uh, much closer to the, the start of that pipeline so that the repository becomes the, um, the authoritative source of a, a manuscript at the beginning of that process. Um, but I think this this is you know quite an ambitious thing to to achieve. Um, but I think we ought to have that discussion at least once um, with them because it doesn't seem that that's even been entertained. Um, and I was just going to reply to Peter just um, to say um, Peter says if there are many re repos, it is essential for TDM that there is a seamless approach to searching and downloading. We don't want to have to learn the APIs for every university in the UK, for example. Um, and I, I completely agree with that, 100%. Um, and a, quite a lot of what we've um, been doing with the next generation repositories uh, recommendations and the technologies that we've been identifying has been aimed 
very much at um, that problem and, and making sure that we don't don't have that problem. Um, so we've got a, a big focus on um, things like resource sync, for example, um, but also on trying to get repositories to adopt conventions um, of um, how uh, full text resources are linked to from metadata records, that kind of thing, so that um, the um, processes which want to um, gather these resources to do um, operations on large numbers of them are not having to um, learn and guess how to access those resources in each repository. This is a really, really important thing. And, th and this is what I was saying earlier about we have to solve the problem of machine access before we solve the problem of machine readability. Um, that's, that's the priority, I think. Would you respond to Peter's next comment? The attraction of large repositories like Europe PMC is that I can search 4 million documents in 10 seconds. A federated system must, must provide that type of response. Does the next generation repository give me a single point of access? Well, no, the point, the point is that the next generation repository approach um, allows people to provide those aggregations. That, that what we want to do is support those aggregations. And in fact, you know, the, the um, people representing some of those aggregations were very much part of the Next Generation's repositories working group and, and behind those recommendations. We want to make it easier for um, aggregations such as um, the Open University's core system, um, which is the one I happen to know best, um, to make it easier for those, those systems to be able to harvest and aggregate and index and make available large um, um, aggregations of, of resources. That's, that's the point. It's not about um, a federated system where somebody runs a text mining system which individually interrogates each repository. Those kinds of systems don't tend to scale very well. They, they usually end up having to be an aggregation if only for uh, caching on the network. And so the, the approach is to support those, those kinds of aggregations so that then you can do your text mining on, on those aggregations. Okay, uh, Peter, Peter says he agrees. So that's, that's um, always good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think, you know, we're trying to solve this uh, sustainability problem and the distributed environment is also something that responds to the issue of, um, you know, one commercial entity controlling everything. So it, uh, we can have individual institutions participating in a federated way to a, a cohesive system. This will help to fund the system by small scale investments at each institution and also um, reflect, you know, a more international perspective around who's participating in the system. All right, are there any more? Can I just make a quick point? So Pete, Peter's, Peter's asked about time scale, um, and I, I, I interpret that to mean the time scale for repositories to start to do the things we're recommending. Um, and I think we have some information about uh, the repository platforms which are starting to implement some of the technical recommendations. So um, this is just a sort of a public aside to Kathleen, I suppose, but perhaps we ought to um, publish a post sometime about this, you know, about the, the progress that has been made. Um, I mean, I, I can um, say that, for example, I'm, there's a project I'm working on in Japan where we are implementing some of these things now. So I'm aware that some of the platforms are are actively um, some of these um, approaches, but I think probably usefully summarize this for for the community. Yeah, and and I think that's one of our uh, the challenges is that we we we've been putting a lot of effort into the adoption of the recommendations around next generation repositories, but because Plan S has come out with recommendations very different than ours, um, we don't want to have. Um, divide our resources. We want to continue to put our resources into, again, like the kind of functionalities and technologies that we recommended after um, this expert group went through, a, again, like a year and a half of discussion and work around what would be the best um, 
uh, future role and um, functionality for repositories. We have another comment from Jay Rip. Thanks for your responses. On the one hand, we highly value democratic distribution, but on the other, we can't help but fret over the duplication of effort among repositories. And well, if we didn't spend as much time manually adding individual outputs in our local IR, we could potentially be doing other valuable work, such as moving forward Diamond publish, OA publishing in our local environment. But we're strongly against a central commercial. Yeah, uh, it's, it's challenging, it's true. And I think maybe we've gone too far in terms of the distribution. We could have a little less distribution. Um, so we're thinking now from in Canada, for example, of having more a shared approach to some of our repositories, especially in the data context. So uh, I, it's, it's, it's a balance. We need to try to get that balance where there's some distribution, but you know, there's not, we're not wasting a lot of resources at our individual institutions. I, I take your point. But again, if our repositories were at the start of the process, then that, that problem will be mitigated somewhat because those repositories would become um, the resources would only be being um, processed in the local repositories and then thereafter people would be using that that effort, reusing it elsewhere. Yeah. Um, there's another um, question by Gareth. He says, I've, I might have missed the answer. What do you think of Open Door acting as a gatekeeper for compliant repositories? Um, well, we didn't really we have didn't really have a discussion about that actually in the core context um, uh, So I'm not sure I can give you an official response related to that um, I think it's good to have a, a registry of repositories. I think there it's valuable and core has been discussing how we can improve the existing functionality of open door to be more reflective of um, the real repository ecosystem so in, in, in general, I can say I think we, we support having um, a, a good, strong, comprehensive repository registry internationally, but um, whether it should be the gatekeeper of compliance for Plan S is another question. And again, we, we, we haven't discussed that. Um, any other thoughts? I see people are starting to leave for their next meeting, meetings, or to go home, depending on where you're located. All right, well, um, since there seem to be no more comments or questions, um, I'd like to say thank you very much, everyone, for your really great, interesting, and valuable input. Um, again, we will be revising the core um, response to, to Plan S based on some of the discussions we had here and also uh, other input we've gotten from the community. So thank you very much. It's been really helpful for us. And again, um, please get in contact with me if core can help you. Um, uh, in terms of preparing your response and, and aligning it with some of the things we're talking about. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.